Hi everybody, my name is Vanessa Chaparova uh, from Payment Jeans. Welcome to our video. Um, we thought of doing a video because we're quite seasonal with this uh, fraud and chargeback. So today I'm joined by two veterans in the fraud industry. Take it, take it away. Hi guys, uh, I'm Trittle. Uh, thanks for having me when it's here. Uh, I'm currently working as a payments lead um, at a company called Recharge.com based out of Amsterdam. I've been working in payments and fraud for close to a decade now. And yeah, I'm quite excited to be here. And unfortunately, um, we wanted to have him physically as well. But due to circumstances, Neil couldn't join us. But Neil, give uh, give yourself an introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Venetia and Rachel, for the invitation. Um, so yeah, I'm Neil Govender. Um, I'm the VP of sales at Fugu. Uh, I'll elaborate a little bit about Fugu, but later you might have heard of us. Uh, I'm based in Berlin, and uh, I've been in the industry. This year is my anniversary. It's 20 years. And well, we can stop giving my age from that. So happy to be here. <laughs> well, I think, um, how many years do you guys think we have in total? I am a uh, very modest, I'm like four or five years at max. About like 10 years. In the, 20. In the, in the high 30s. <laughs> that's a lot. That, that That's a fair amount. Yeah. It's older than you, right? <laughs> well, it's older than me as well, so. <laughs> yeah, it's actually older than me, yeah. Um. All right, guys. Well, thanks for actually making time for this initiative. I thought it would be very nice to kind of connect to our audiences and um, help out merchants in needs by the best way to do this is by putting um, expertise in one place and just spreading it, spreading the knowledge, right? So um, let's take it easy. When was the, what brought you into the fraud industry? Yeah, for me, I think it is quite accidental. I mean, me and Neil were speaking about it actually a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think I was hired by Wirecard. Uh, like they hired me to basically handle a couple of their high risk fraud merch, uh, high risk merchants. Uh, so I was basically handling gambling and a little entertainment back then. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's how I was introduced to the fraud industry. But also I had a little bit of background as well before I joined them because I, <laughs> I had my master's in AI uh, back in the day. And um, as part of my final thesis, I actually helped the bank build their credit risk model. Uh, this is like back in the day when I used to actually program as well, but I, I, yeah, I left that long behind though. Oh, that's so. quite expensive. Neil, what about you? Um, yeah, so as Rachel said, we, we were speaking about it. I always love sharing the story because it was accidental. Um, it was uh, <laughs> late 2003. Um, I was fresh out of uh, university. I was... Uh, doing some uh, non-fraud related jobs. So it was uh, debt collection for a uh, fashion retailer. So it was, you know, just doing my job, getting people to pay their debts. And uh, I looked into the newspaper because people were, were not really looking for jobs online. I looked into the newspaper for something uh, that's actually going to take me on a different uh, career path. And uh, there was an agency who had a contract for online payment gateway and the payment gateway was specialized in processing online credit card transactions for us gamblers and and what actually the job entailed was that after i did my my normal nine to five job uh i got to their office at 6 p.m <laughs> evening which was the us morning or midday and i had a spreadsheet uh, of uh, full clear text credit card numbers, expiry dates, CVV addresses, <laughs> and I had to put on a U.S. accent. So my, <laughs> so my alias was that I had to phone U.S. banks pretending that I was from some other company to verify the uh, credit card details uh, of, a, uh, of a U.S. gambler. So um, pretty much had like different billing descriptors that were disguised questions. <laughs> so it was like, hey, I, my name is Peter. I'm calling you from uh, lawnmower.com. We have a customer waiting to do an authorization. Could you confirm his details? So 
that was really my job. And um, I was supporting fraud analysts. And yeah, about six months later, I became a fraud analyst. So this is really where I started. So that was back in the days before, like, actually people were encrypting credit card information or anything. You just had, like, all the 16 digits. Full trust. When Peter, when Peter we trust. Um, I remember the first time that I saw a fraud alert, and I was like, delete. <laughs> and then I kept saying more, and I was like, delete, delete. And then I, at one moment, I received, like, a <laughs> the, the warning from Visa, and I was like, oh, no, I should not have deleted these. <laughs> So then I really had to learn on the job how to tackle them. Um, all right. And since uh, there is a very large, extensive period of time before, since you started and until now, how has fraud developed between that time span? I think in my experience, I think it's changed the extent that, I mean, we see a lot more scams happening now as opposed to just like normal chargebacks and just like normal like notifications of fraud. I think like those are very common when I started working but nowadays you know you see scams you see like social engineering uh has become has gone to a different level completely uh it, it, yes absolutely insane uh, i would say with regards to how social engineering and scams are taking over the industry especially like in the digital goods industry as well i think uh, yeah uh scams definitely are more prevalent but also i think it's like fraudsters in general have access to a lot more data in general like the they're able to make more informed, more targeted attacks at people as opposed to like 20 years ago where they were just trying, trying their luck and seeing what stuck like, you know, so yeah. I must say there is quite a lot that tried luck. Oh yeah, uh, sure. That, that definitely happens. Because <laughs> I received a text message in Dutch from a Polish number that says, Mom, my phone, uh, I dropped my phone, so can you please call me and WhatsApp me on this number? And that was the day that I found out I have a child. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, what about you? What do you think? Um, so maybe just to, um, you know, uh, what Rutu mentioned, I think uh, it's important not to ignore it. Um, these scams, you know, it's playing on, on, on emotions, uh, you know, uh, Authorized push payments, so uh, APP. Uh, this falls directly into what we uh, mentioned. Um, the actual amount of uh, funds that that gets transferred uh, is much larger than doing an online purchase. So just just to cover what you said, I, I'm fully with him on that. Uh, so from my experience, going uh, back into my time. Um, the tools that were available online, you know, the open source tools, these were non-existent, right? 2003, four, or maybe I just didn't know about them, but the type of fraud we saw was opportunistic fraud. Um, so, you know, people making a few transactions from one device or, uh, but well, what's really evolved, uh, because it's, it's two decades now, it's, it's easy to operate uh, on scale. There's so much of free tools. Um, so fraudsters adapt very quick and how you can relate this to, to how fraud prevention evolved is, uh, you know, uh, back then it was rules. Everyone relied on rules because the rules worked. You could put a rule in and it, it stopped fraud for a while, but now you yeah. put a rule in it. I make a coffee. <laughs> and then it's not theater rule. <laughs> I'll make a coffee and I'll come back and, and the, the fraud is adapted because they can operate at scale. So in summary, operating at scale, it's validated by, uh, you know, larger attacks on, on, uh, on databases where fraudsters have a lot of data. They can automate, uh, uh, you know, at scale and they have more insights. So pretty much, you know, what uh, we're doing from uh, understanding customers, fraudsters uh, have the same tools to understand if they're fraud or not. Uh, Absolutely. I want to kind of zoom in on the APP fraud because I remember from when I was very, very young, my grandma, what's I called her, and I was like, Grandma, like, how are you? She she was so used to getting called by scammers. She's like, you're not my granddaughter. <laughs> she just hung up on me. And this was like the first time that I kind of like went through APP fraud, but that was like, what, 12 years ago? Um, 
So nowadays, it feels like APP is such a big buzzword as well. You have like the fake UPS messages. You have um, fraudsters changing their voices with um, AI and those kind of things. Um, what are your guys' takeaways on uh, APP fraud in general and this huge trend that's happening right now? I think that's the thing with APP fraud. Let go. I think, like I mentioned, like there are more scams than not very often as well. And and currently, I think the the fact is like scams are not like I mean, so, so merchants and banks are not, are not liable when people get scammed. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I would say. I mean, yeah. as a as an employee for my company, you're always glad that you're not liable. But as a customer itself, you are also sad that yeah, your your money is gone, right? So like, what's the balance between that? Is the whole point, uh, or like, where is the Where's the middle point that we can meet uh, other regulators at with regards to APP fraud, I think, at this point? Exactly. Maybe, the, do you think the governments can also step in and they can find some kind of how to regulate? I, I mean, I mean, I think, that's the problem, right? I think uh, I've been hearing through the grapevine quite a bit that they plan to start like regulating this, which basically means banks and merchants get liable, simple as that, which is very difficult to kind of control because like as merchants or as banks, it's very hard to kind of control what's happening there. Like how do you like build models or how you, how do you use AI to actually stop scams from happening? It's quite hard. I mean, it's possible, but I think that's still quite far off. I think as far as I know, with, the, with like the way our technology is, because it's a, it's bank transfers very often. It's, a, it's very manually. That it's a one-way, exactly. one-way transaction. Like how do you reverse that? It's... Um, I think yeah, like there's there's a there's a lot more to it that actually than that meets the eye is what I would say for APP based fraud. And it's good that you mentioned the uh, regulation and banks are, are not liable. So uh, what's actually happening in the UK at the moment uh, is they're introducing a regulation where victims get reimbursed for APP fraud because banks yeah. can monitor these type of attacks based on, you know, who's receiving the funds from these attacks. So there are uh, monitoring systems which can be in place to, to actually uh, protect uh, customers. So, I mean, like if the UK is introducing this, I'm sure uh, this will, will uh, become quite the norm in a few years. Uh, let's say countries that have a high online transfer, high scam rate, and what's also good to mention is because we obviously come from the online payment world, uh, these scams, uh, the transfers happen online most of the time. Uh, well, it has to be online, but the actual scams can uh, happen uh, online or with the phone or in person. So I, exactly. I, I'm just sitting here. Please blur this out on a video, but I, <laughs> my rent uh, has to be paid to a new company and I call them today. Okay to verify that they actually posted me this letter. Um, and this is one of the ways where you, you can have authorized push payment fraud because uh, they will put letters in the old building to say you've got a new uh, bank account for you to pay your rent into. That's smart. <laughs> um, and this is authorized uh, push payment because now I'm authorizing a payment for my rent. Yeah. Um, and obviously the, the other common one online, you know, the dating scams where men and women are, are coerced into uh, transferring money to a potential uh, soulmate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> potential. <laughs> I'm just warning you that vehicle is with it. I'm pretty sure you're quite covered in this area. You wouldn't be scamming the obvious oh, wow. <laughs> You're getting um, pulled out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, I think the, the, the most common one is... Uh, you know, when, when somebody tries to spoof your 3D secure code, like, hey, we noticed a, a irregular transaction, I'm calling you from the bank, uh, we've sent you a code, could you send us a code or you could you please confirm that this payment happened? You know, these are yeah. amazing ways. So there's multiple attack vectors through different channels and this makes it really complicated. And from what I've read, uh, APP fraud is, you know, it's way bigger than our traditional online e-commerce frauds. Maybe it's good to, um, for the the listeners that are going to also see this video, 
We're located in the Netherlands, right? And Neil is in Germany. And in the Netherlands, in April, you do your tax returns. So that is the peak of APP fraud because fraudsters send out uh, fake letters that you need to pay back the government money. And that's why the government always, like, around this period says, like, the government's uh, bank is ING, right? Don't fall for any other bank. <laughs> now, it's, it's, it's really interesting that you mentioned this because, like, you know, like, I, I was telling Valencia a while ago, like, for, for the last couple of weeks, I've been, like, receiving calls from this, like, unknown German number and claiming that, uh, claiming that there's basically, uh, claiming that there's, like, a 100 euro fraud transaction on my PayPal account. I did, I did like click one to kind of like speak to an agent. And I did that, of course. And then someone with a very thick Indian accent comes uh, in the background and starts speaking to me in, in like really broken English. And, and all I can say is like, at least know your customer. Like, you know, like, like see if you're trying to scam. Like, <laughs> But I mean, I think if we go down this road, um, there's going to be so many examples of if you push fraud and, well, it's APP fraud, but I think uh, let's try to keep it short and uh, we can move along with the with the topic. Um, okay, so let's say um, we can start with going back down to memory lane and um, through your career. What was the biggest challenge that you faced in fraud and how did you solve it? I think for me, I think it specifically happened, I think a couple of years ago when I was working for this quick commerce company. Like they were selling like so like not at groceries like, you know, like they were selling like more expensive items so i would say like more like macbooks and iphones which could be like delivered in 30 minutes or less to your home perfect right so um when they launched in france back then as you all know like france is a hotbed for fraud in general and we saw like this massive spike in orders being placed by like young 12 13 year old kids on this e-scooters on the street they were ordering like three, four MacBooks in one go. And of course, like, you know, they're all 3D secure transactions. Everything was like, like quite secure, but then they managed to get like spoof the SIM cards, spoof everything at, and managed to get like the customer's information all in detail. And yeah, like if you're losing like a couple of MacBooks a week, uh, that's like small kids, like 12, 13 year old kids. I mean, on on the street, right? Honestly, can yeah. we just take a moment and appreciate how creative those kids were? I mean, they, they probably were working for fraud drinks. That you, you would figure. I, I would hope so. <laughs> and they're wonder kids. Nobody knows. <laughs> oh yeah, they're absolute geniuses. I figure. But yeah, this kept happening like for for a while, yeah. and yeah, uh, as the fraud head for the company, I think like suddenly like I was called upon to like fix this. I was like, it, it's a small company. We didn't really have like fraud solutions in place. Like. It was also like harder to basically use the like third party solutions immediately. So we had to like get inventive with our own solutions in house to fix it, I guess, back then. Yeah. Exactly. But also like these are just such a I think the thing with fraud is that you expect it to come a little bit later after the, the payment has become yeah. it. Doesn't matter what kind of a payment it is. And the fact that if it happens within a half an hour, you don't you don't expect that it's gonna be a long time. Yeah, it's it's too hard to fix it because especially with like normal e commerce retailers and you know, other like, the three to four day gap between the order being placed and the goods being delivered. So like there is still time to cancel the order or like, you know, like figure out a solution, but in 30 minutes, it's impossible, right? So uh, I think when the driver got kidnapped, probably, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just joking, but, um, but, but things did get pretty messy before they got better, definitely. So, yeah. Yeah. Neil, what about you? What, what was your Everest? Tell us. Fraud uh, stories to share, as you can imagine. Um, so <laughs> it's good, uh, good that uh, you know uh, Rachel uh, gave it from a business uh, perspective. I'm sure many people listening have many scams uh, which uh, they've uncovered. Um, but I'd like to address uh, the challenge being on the vendor side, uh, you know, servicing merchants and. Uh, so I was working at a, at a large uh, online payment gateway. So before my time in sales, um, so we had a team that were analyzing data that were trying to stop fraud uh, for our managed services uh, customers. Um, the, the the challenge that 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 we had was we un we understood what the fraud was, we knew how to stop the fraud, but it was 
a huge challenge to change uh, the mindset internally of our developers. So we had a development team that was a shared resource for the entire business for finance reconciliation, for accepting payments, for fraud, for reporting. And uh, it was always conflicting priorities. And when you have a fraud attack, and part of our job is now to stop the fraud, we knew how to stop it. It was actually the process uh, involved in getting this rule created. So in order to get a rule created, you needed to translate what you've seen. So why do we need this rule? Right? So mm -hmm. you have to write a story in a business request document. I know uh, <laughs> the condition of the rule, right? And we had like grades, like is it a tier a tier one, tier two, tier three part? <laughs> the type of change request, is it a one, two, or three? And each of those requests <laughs> had an SLA. So like a, one had like a change to an existing rule. It would have been done on the same day. If it's a modification, like you're changing a condition on a rule, it was two to three days. And if you needed a new rule, it took seven days. <laughs> this is really <laughs> outside you, honestly, with listening to it. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine what it did for, for people uh, that really wanted to stop? <laughs> and the quality that we were delivering, uh, because we knew how to stop the fraud, but fraud continued for seven days. So <laughs> rule. Tomorrow, they change. Then you need one day to change the parameter on the rule or add a condition. So this, this was <laughs> challenging. Uh, this was, I would say, my biggest challenge from um, <laughs> fraud operations, really getting the business to adapt. And uh, how we overcame this was we quantified how much we could have stopped, right? Uh, if we were able to react faster. And the solution uh, that we identified was we had a dedicated developer um, to uh, solved, uh, a lot of <laughs> But so basically, you had ridiculously high overhead costs, and every fraud request deserved the business plan, basically. And, and you can imagine being an analyst and every time you identify uh, a new rule that you have to write to the change request, it wasn't, wasn't working so well. But thank you for that. You <laughs> understood. It wasn't just a challenge at, 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 at the payment gate where I work at. It was a, a global challenge and uh, vendors introduced, uh, uh, you know, like automate ways to create rules, to test them on historic data and to deploy them without development resources. It's crazy that I think that the industry also involve, uh, evolved to that kind of extent that all of that now can be done by the payments manager or the fraud specialist uh, within the company within a few clicks. In like, seconds, yeah, right? Yeah. Escalate it. Like your fraud Hopefully analyst not. comes. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> your fraud analyst comes and they say, oh, um, just to let you know, we have a spike of 5,000 euros. We need to do something about it. And you can just go into your gateway or in your fraud solution. You can be like, okay, first, let's see the card. Let's blacklist it. Let's see the velocity. You can you can trace back so You have access to so much data nowadays. Um, and since we're mingling on the topic of tooling, um, and since we're in chargeback season, um, for the people that are watching this, this is shot in February. Um, so... Uh, yeah, let's talk about the tooling. How would you manage your tooling in order to salvage chargebacks I think, in this season? I think with regards to like how to manage your tooling, I mean, if you have a tool to begin with. True. Uh, uh, fact. Uh, yeah, the fact is if you have a tool, great. If you don't have a tool, get a tool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but If you have a bad one, get a good one. Get a better one, yes. <laughs> but... <laughs> call, call Neil we'll call Neil yeah yeah but yeah but uh, keep on I think it's uh, I think it's always advisable to use your tool with the conjunction with like historical and better data all this but like, so like there's no point of just like putting like random rules up in your tool or you know just it doesn't make sense so always always like leverage your historical data uh, through the last seasons that you have been through to see exactly what kind of frauds to expect uh, where it's coming from, just like patterns that you could probably identify and, and use that to advantage very often. And 
it, and it, this could range from like static rules or also the same than the speaking to your maybe like your account manager at your fraud prevention provider to like tweak their models as well to to the best extent possible. Of course, like, you can't avoid all fraud or all chargebacks, but you can do your best to kind of like minimize the damage. And this has to be, I think, done with like done with like leveraging data. Yeah. And not just like going crazy with your tool basically. So which is what happens very often. Unfortunately, I've seen so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think also there's a lot of things to um, Neil. I'm gonna hand you the mic, the mic, <laughs> in a second. Um, but I think it also doesn't stop there. It really matters on your relationship with the payment service provider mm -hmm. as well. It's um, because a merchant and a fraud tool can do a lot together. Like they can they can combine forces and they can like do, you know, like Power Rangers when they combine forces and then they fight the crime. Um, but without the PSP actually sharing information or like which you require that it's kind of like something missing at the end. But like definitely, right? I think so. Like I think like a part that I missed out is like if you don't have a fraud prevention provider, always try to like let like most PSPs out there have like some sort of tool in place. Like try to like leverage that as much as possible. Not all tools are built equally, of course, but they can still do a pretty like like rudimentary and a decent job of stopping the basic kind of frauds. Uh, so, like, don't leave your systems completely vulnerable, at least, right? And, yeah, I think oh, that's what I would say. And, but like you mentioned, I mean, uh, speak to your account managers, add your PSP, have the better, like, synergies there with your with your partners as much as possible. Because, yeah. And let's give it to the to the tool master himself, <laughs> Neil. <laughs> yeah, so so I, as as you know, I, I've seen many tools. I, I've been selling many tools. I've been, uh, you know, part of a product team that that's created tools. Um, but one thing I I, I would like to to point out is that uh, when you get to uh, the season where you're going to get a lot of traffic, um, what one first needs to weigh all these what what are the accepted thresholds for the business? Without having understanding what are the KPIs, you cannot try to stop all fraud because if you're going to try to yeah. do that, you're going to decline a lot of users. So, uh, one of the first things uh, I would say, two things to run to parallel is what is uh, acceptable thresholds for acceptance rates and chargebacks and fraud and decline rates for the business because this is the period that you're going to generate a lot of revenue. So, understanding that should come first also understanding and um, you know like from your your marketing team what type of promotions the frequency when these promotions happen because you don't want an overtuned fraud strategy that's going to stop all of the fraud but you're going to decline a lot of your customers so understanding how much of risk uh, that you're going to take uh, or, or able to take uh, is a very good starting point um i would say you know uh, when you when you looking at experts, uh, you're going to have internal experts. So, uh, you know, the person that's creating the rules might not be the person that's actually reviewing the transactions. So, I think any business today is making data driven decisions. If you're not, that you should. Um, but uh, speak to the people on the ground. If you're not, good dog. <laughs> because usually where it starts is you know you understand your data, but also validating hypothesis so speak to the team find out what they're seeing because there could be emerging attacks that you're not aware of it doesn't reflect in your data so try to validate what team on the ground is seeing um, um, that's one thing and and the other thing is drawing on the global insights from your uh, fraud vendor so if you are using a fraud vendor or if you're using an online payment gateway uh, they understand what actually happens around this time uh, so draw on the on on these global insights, and of course benchmark yourselves uh, against uh, you know other similar sellers uh, in your industry. Yeah, and I think here it's also very good to distinguish the difference between the kind of tools we're talking about fraud tools, and but we're also that 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 doesn't mean tools like uh, RDR from Verify and Itoka because these ones are chargeback resolution tools, which already, if you haven't prevented the fraud of resoluting a chargeback or a dispute, 
is so much more expensive than a fraud alert. All right, but not everybody has a tool. So what would you guys recommend for merchants that don't have a tool? Cole Neal. <laughs> He's the man. Um, <laughs> no, but honestly, I think, uh, so like jokes aside, I think the fact is, I mean, like a lot of merchants out there don't have the technical capability to integrate a tool very often, or they're too small, or like the startup, they don't really, like it's not in there, let's say the roadmap, while they're kind of like expanding as a company, but they're basically hyper growth. They have other things to kind of like figure out before like installing a fraud tool because like that's a lot of like development work that's needed. So I think like going back to my previous answer as well, like these, I mean, everyone has a PSP always. So try to use your PSP as much as possible. Like there are tools in there that can help people. So try to use that as much as possible. Uh, on the on the other hand, also like like I said, you probably have like so fraud analysts in your in your company. Use it to your advantage as well. So like uh, going back to what like Neil said, you know, so like know exactly what your fraud appetite is or what like a risk appetite is, based on which you can like create some kind of static rules at least. Static rules are better than no rules at all. But of course, static rules also at the same time like do reduce performance. So like, but I would say static rule like I. Would agree, agree to disagree because static rules is good, but you can't have very specialized static rules because either way, you're going to block so much legitimate traffic exactly. and you're going to hit all the false positives and then you're still losing money. And the idea is that we make businesses that don't lose that much money. No, so what was my point? So like companies like which can't afford a tool, I would rather have them build like some sort of rules then not have a any rules at all and be completely open to fraud. Uh, I think it's a balance between seeing how much fraud, like adult, how much like false positives like you're ready to basically endure. Whereas, uh, right. yeah, exactly, always. So, yeah. Neil, what do you think? Although you have a lot of experience with tools, you also have experience without tools within seven business days, of course. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... You know, uh, some merchants are very really small. So uh, again, it depends on the size because you could just have a, a one-man show selling uh, protein online, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, or you could have somebody just uh, selling um, self-made uh, crafts or, or whatever. So it always depends on volume. Some of these uh, companies can use the tools which are already embedded in the payment gateway. But you would be surprised how many of them are, uh, you know, running their shops. Well, they have to be running it on major e-commerce platforms like Shopify or Vtex or Magento. And a lot of these e-commerce platforms have fraud tools embedded in them. And these merchants are not aware of them. So it's, it's if you're not experiencing fraud today, uh, that's good. Maybe your product is not. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no one wants it. But um, yeah, I, I mean, not everyone needs uh, a fraud tool, uh, but there will be a point where if you're looking to grow your business, uh, you're going to need something. And it's about being prepared. So for merchants selling on Shopify, Shopify has their, their a fraud tool within that. So it's not just on the payment gateway site, but a lot of these e-commerce platforms have a app store and these app stores have fraud tools and not just for there's many many of our competitors who have free versions of the apps so you don't need to be fully comprehensive but get to know them get to know what the capabilities are and uh, you can implement something basic um, and important for for merchants are on different stages if you are starting off and you don't have fraud and you're selling something nice, fraud's going to hit you because fraudsters are opportunistic. <laughs> so, so always, always be prepared. And for, for companies that are, are looking to expand the, the scale uh, stage, you don't really want to over invest in fraud operations. So you don't want to say, well, today we're doing 10,000 transactions a month. By the end of the year, we're going to be doing 10x, so that means we need to increase our team size. Look at solutions that are going to help you scale. 
because you never know what is going to happen. Your business will be a great success, uh, but you don't want fraud operations to stunt that growth by declining new customers. So being able to, to scale is, is hugely All right, so let me kind of create a very hybrid exercise of this. Let's say you're a merchant, you just got your first Protool or you're using the extension of Shopify or some kind of CMS off the shelf platform. Um, what are two rules that you would recommend for startups? Oh, wow, that's a uh, okay, the spot. Do a fraud. Two fraud rules for startups. <laughs> oh, wow, that's. I mean, that's really hard to answer. I mean, that's quite weird. Okay, do you want me to answer first? I yep. can give you okay, an example. Go for it, yeah. Uh, okay, you go, you go. You, you, you are the high risk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, if my merchant is targeting explicitly a region, let's say if I'm selling in the Netherlands, I would not accept the card from Nigeria. Good, good. Yeah, that's probably fair, yeah. Like, I'm going to I'm gonna go good old dual block. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, so like geo blocks definitely, and I would try to maybe use like some kind of like IP blocks as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's always very really useful. I mean, if your IP address is coming from I don't know from the US and, or, or from Mexico, and you're like selling products in Germany, this it's a little fishy, definitely, and especially if you're new. Like people don't, I think people underestimate how fraud can like drown businesses completely. Like they can go make them go bankrupt, especially if you're new, yeah. and you have no more. Like uh, yeah, if it's like fresh with funding so yeah so like the, these small rules can basically stop a lot of fraud so yeah if i may quote neil neil once said fraud specialists are very opinionated so i'm gonna agree to disagree <laughs> my first answer would be uh i'd leave the job immediately because uh, <laughs> i cannot do this on on two rules uh yeah <laughs> i mean honestly like but but no but no, that's not a fair answer, Neil. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd leave it. Uh, we went into fraud voluntarily. <laughs> but but let's, let's see how I'll take this approach. Um, firstly, I, I would uh, look at where my traffic is coming from, right? So what you and Rifu mentioned is highly relevant. So if you, uh, you know, like one uh, IP, because yes, your type of business could get hit with an IP, uh, attacks. So if you are really getting these type of attacks and put it in, right? So data driven, always data driven. And uh, what you uh, said, um, Benicia, about the uh, IP business match geolocation stuff, uh, also relevant. So again, these are the tools. So if you only really have to do two rules, uh, that's one thing. If I'm not looking at the data, if the, uh, let's say I don't have access to the data or anything, uh, and it's a whole new store. And for some reason, I'm only limited to two rules. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm well, not limited to two, two, but what are the two? Yeah, so, 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 so I have no data insight. So in this scenario, no insight into the data, but I know what my shop is selling. So let's say I'm selling iPhones. Uh, or, or So let's say I'm selling iPhones. I would limit the number of items that can be purchased in a day. Yeah. That, that's one For thing. Sure. Uh, because it's on iPhone. If I'm an online casino, I would never do this, right? No. If, uh, I'm going to kill it. So I'm putting it into perspective here. Like if I'm really forced to doing this. And again, this is not good practice. So I'm now forced <laughs> to do uh, And the other thing is I would look at what is my average customer spend Right, and I would put a limit not on the average customer spin, but I will either do a two x or three x depending on what are, what are my sale patterns are. Um, but again, I don't have insight, so I would say what's normal. Uh, somebody spins uh, to buy two iPhones, maybe that's quite normal. So I, I would uh, then just put like a a spin cap. So I would go uh, velocity on count and premium uh, volume. Yeah. Uh, again, please, please, I, I will will really impact my <laughs> reputation. Yeah. So my, <laughs> I would never go with two rules, but I was put on the spot. <laughs> um, all right, guys, let's take a. Uh, um, we've been so down memory lane and those kind of things, but if we look at twenty twenty four, we're in the beginning of the year, right? And 
as one very wise man says, fraud prevention starts from yesterday. Um, what, how do you think that um, the current industry changes, so the development of AI and those kind of things will affect 2024? And what should merchants watch out for throughout the year, especially when we go later on into the holiday season? I think like, I, I think like we already mentioned there multiple times, so like prevention is better than cure with fraud all day. So like, if you haven't done something, do it yesterday. I'll, I'll start doing it. Like there's no other way around it, right? Because fraud, like does not like, it does not like, it does not like ask for permission and come to your door. Like it, it happens. So be prepared, I think is my first, uh, first piece of advice. And the fact is, I think like AI is getting big, definitely. Uh, AI-based fraud is all around. Uh, processors have so much access to a lot more data about you. Like, they're basically using AI models to, do, to, to like, defraud you. Yeah, so, like, you have to, like, fight fire with fire, the way I see it, right? That I'm not receiving personal calls from the president? I know, right? It's just... <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was special. It can be all thought, so, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lie. <laughs> No, but yes, basically, so, so like fight fire with fire. I mean, if you don't have like, um, I mean, try to like limit your uh, reliance on static rules as, as much as possible. Uh, try to op automate your rules. Try to use your PSP, PSPs, uh, like like machine learning models, maybe a little bit more. But try to automate stuff as much as possible because because like relying on static rules means they can be circumvented really easily and also on the long run it will decrease the performance as well. So yeah, but that's my advice, I think, for the coming year, definitely. So for, uh, my my perspective, I mean, there's so many things that you, that you can do and the application of AI for good and bad. And I guess if we knew everything, uh, there wouldn't be any fraud. So um, I, I would say, you know, besides on, on the actual payment fraud, uh, there's many other areas where, so have, as we said, we spoke about authorized push payments. We spoke, we didn't speak about customer onboarding, merchant onboarding. So like your KYB, KYC processes, there's many areas in which, uh, that it, that will be impacted that eventually leads to, uh, somebody losing money. Um, and, um, one thing, uh, that, that we should always uh, pay attention to is Fraud is evolving, and it we don't know at what point. Uh, so merchants also need to evolve in their fraud prevention strategy. So um, there's many, uh, you know, experienced uh, thought leaders on this topic. I'm sure everyone's heard about what could come. Uh, I, I don't want to duplicate that, but uh, what I, my advice to merchants is to experiment, try out new tools. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, he was out there. AI has been there, but there's many other uh, emerging technologies, uh, innovators. Uh, experiment with them and see how that uh, is going to to improve uh, your strategy. Because today you might not have a problem, but in a few months or later in the year, you're gonna end up with a huge challenge. So knowing what's out there uh, is going to help you address what uh, is about to come. So that, that is my advice. Experiment, talk to to vendors, uh, new vendors, or speak to your uh, to your vendor actually, and find out what is in their roadmap as well. Uh, so if your vendor is not evolving, uh, I'm not going to say this is a problem. Leave them, but this should be a signal. For you. Uh, Call me like <laughs> Hey there, hey there, vendor. Your vendor is not evolving. You should start preparing to understand what are other vendors out there doing. So it's very really important uh, to understand what is in their roadmap, in the year roadmap, in the two-year uh, roadmap. But no, I completely agree. And I think, um, especially, okay, if we focus on Christmas and those kind of things, I cannot stress it enough. People merchants vendors please prepare your fraud rules from now like <laughs> well don't activate them from now just think let's start thinking from now what will be the patterns and look at last year look what happened last year see how it is and then uh, try to figure out how are you going to solve this start from like early october and um carry on with it yeah. um, also just to add to that um 
we should also think, you know, when we when we're speaking fraud prevention, a fraud prevention strategy is not only a tool. Yeah, right? yes. the strategy is about many things, and uh, you know, we think what strategy People. it is, what what is coming in the future, right? Be prepared for for, for what's going to to happen, but it also involves business process. It involves other areas of the business, understanding. Uh, how your what your business might look like in in the next six months or the next year. So, so um, when we speak uh, fraud prevention strategy, it's not just a tool. It's it's many areas uh, that should be considered. Uh, that, as that's very interesting, actually, and I agree with that. Right? I think it's not all just tools. I mean, so like for example, like if the customer care team, for example, prepared to handle the influx of calls which will automatically happen when you have more fraud. Is the finance team kind of like dealing with how fraud you know, fraud and chargebacks are handled in the books, for example? So there's a, there's a lot more to it, for sure, yeah. Our payments and frauds finally got to work together. Sorry? Our payments and frauds finally. Yeah. <laughs> and on this season. <laughs> yeah, and Rito, you, you actually hit a very, one of the biggest reasons for, for friendly fraud, besides people knowing how to abuse, uh, when when you a merchant can make a good customer turn that by not giving them the support they need, yeah. why did you bill me twice? There was realistically an error. You have a chance to to prevent that chargeback by refunding them. It was a billing error, or you or you, uh, you know you build the incorrect amount, or uh, the item wasn't delivered. You 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 could cancel that order and refund it. Now somebody's waiting for an order and and you're forcing them to charge back by not giving them the support they need. So this is a huge driver. Maybe also something to add to this. Um, I think people and merchants, especially, real that fail to realize how important a refund policy is. Like refund policy, especially like a very solid refund policy, can help you solve so many issues that you might have to face and with customer support and with chargebacks and with fraud. Um, so just refund them the money. <laughs> it's gonna be okay. And if you really have a reason not to refund them the money. Let's hope that you have a very good success because we're <laughs> success team. Um, but I think it's very important that you have not just payments working as payments or fraud working as fraud, but you have like this more like team effort and centralization of effort and ongoing communication, you know, kind of like the scrum communication. If you look into it, then you have like, instead of just six people talking like this, they're going to have like all different communication channels. So speaking about um, solution providers, speaking about refunds, and understanding their roadmap, but also knowing who your vendor is. Because last week, uh, there was, let's say, uh, a fraud industry a veteran and a thought leader that uh, exposed a new vendor. A and I'll mention the vendor's name, so you can edit it out later. But they were mm -hmm. called, uh, and basically, they were a very early stage startup that was Mm -hmm. out to help merchants uh, prevent refund fraud. Now, this thought leader actually exposed them because he was working with uh, this group uh, of individuals. They were they were an American uh, uh, company founded by uh, some university graduates, very young guys, and he exposed them for actually being refund fraudsters themselves. <laughs> he exposed them on LinkedIn and what actually happened is these guys were operating underground, uh, you know, complete uh, refund process, and uh, they were operating on, on the dark web, and um, they were exposed on LinkedIn uh, last week. And yesterday, I saw the post that uh, this company has vanished. The page is closed down. The LinkedIn team <laughs> files are gone, and uh, uh, the founders chose a wire card. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, if you're going to hide something, yeah. you might as well hide it underneath somebody's nose, you know? So that's smart. That that I have to think about that movie with the the fraudsters that were like also doing like the magic tricks. It kind of gives me that. Uh, I forgot about uh, the goal. Uh, memento. Which, no, not memento. The, um, it was something with a number. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Maybe, guys, comment it down in the LinkedIn video. Yeah, I forgot what it talks. <laughs> and then we can find out which is the movie. Um, all right. And I think this is a good time to kind of create a checklist for the people watching this. 
Let's name three takeaways um, that you would be mindful when going into fraud and charge. I think like we are, I think again, like uh, sort of going back to our conversation today um, is to like leverage historical data and leverage data as much as possible. That's one. Yeah, just make like data driven decisions. You know, that's very important. Uh, I would also say like a collaborate with your PSPs if you don't have a tool in house because like they will be your best friends until you're big enough to afford a tool or integrate a tool of your own. So like so like maximize the uh, maximize what you have in house as much as possible. Uh, the last one is like try to refrain from using like too many manual processes and too many static rules as these do tend to like reduce overall performance and they can be easily circumvented. So like these are my three like go tos. Uh, before yeah, before fraud, uh, fraud and chargeback season. Neil, yeah, what do you think? Um, so um, I would say going into the fraud uh, season, um, also going back to what I mentioned, understand what are your target KPIs, what are our our what's the risk appetite like, what what are we targeting, uh, each of the revenue or acceptance rate, understanding those targets, um that will enable you to adjust your, your strategy. So again, outside of, of the fraud tool, it could be uh, support. It could just be, um, um, it could be many things that, that, that exist outside of, of your tool. Uh, within the tool, I would say, uh, without listing specifics, advice is do not make wholesale changes to your uh, fraud uh, strategy. So don't go and change it uh, so drastically for the fraud season that you wouldn't be able to now make an adjustment if you're getting self uh, optimal performance. So if you just go and and do something completely different just for the fraud season, that's not my advice. Um, no, exactly. Um, and then what probably a mistake most of us have made as a fraud manager uh, is uh, over tuning. So overtuning a, a rule set. So you're overtuning it to pick up all of the fraud that you encountered throughout the year. You want to stop it. <laughs> in the fraud you're going to stop it in November. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> yeah. I don't need details anyway. Yeah, yeah. Over, <laughs> overtuning is firstly, uh, one is it's going to impact your, your acceptance rate. But you're going to overtune it so much that your catch rate, how much of fraud you're going to identify is not going to be that great because you're trying to catch something very specific. So, so you're going to lose a lot on this balance. Um, but I think a lot of people know about this, but overtuning uh, is, is a, a really big, uh, let's say, red flag and everyone should be aware of it. It's, yeah. I, I, let me put it into perspective. It's like, uh, <laughs> you know, when you want to get back on the on the fitness part, you want to make <laughs> You want to go to the gym and you want to do every single weight in the gym. Five days a week. Use every machine or do a <laughs> week's workout within one day. There's going to be a negative impact on that. And the same when it comes to your, your, your eating plan, you want to change everything that it no longer becomes sustainable. Right? I'm speaking from experience here. So um, do something that's manageable and, and uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't make that mistake of, of just making changes so drastic that you'll never know how to correct them again. How was a boot camp then? It's here. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Mels, if you're watching this, it was great. It's amazing. Don't make me do more push up. <laughs> well, I think this was very, very insightful, guys. Um, and I, just for the people on LinkedIn, this is a collaborative video. So I would kind of want to give you guys the chance to um, introduce you, introduce your um, companies and create a little platform on which we can People can know more about you. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, let's start with Neil. This time, the other way around. <laughs> um, a little bit about FUBU. So FUBU provides a new breed of uh, payment fraud, chargeback liability, and compliance solutions. We decouple payment acceptance from payment verification. So in simple words, yes, we separate the two processes of approving a payment and verifying a customer. Traditionally, and what happens now in most uh, solutions, these two processes are happen at the point of checkout. Why we do it? It results in higher approval rates and better fraud detection. Uh, we have a multi-tier system, which 
addresses diverse fraud types across the transaction lifecycle from onboarding, payments, returns, and chargebacks. This empowers merchants and payment providers to confidently accept transactions, which they currently reject. So one of the biggest problems in the industry is false declines, and this is an area which we currently excel in. So if you're looking to to not only strengthen your, your fraud prevention, but to fall in line where the industry is going about, um, you know, cost optimization, uh, payment orchestration is a, a big point. Talk to us because we will uh, be able to, uh, to help you. Uh, we'll get to the bottom of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Neil, he's, he's your man. Just call Neil for everything. And uh, did it too? Mm -hmm. uh, work for different companies like Zalando, Expondo, Arrive, and now uh, my current job is with a company called Recharge. Ritual, you left out your best secret. The best, your best secret you kept from us is that you actually worked for Best Secret, right? Yeah, I worked for Best Secret as well by, uh, for a few months in between as well, uh, back in the day. <laughs> but yeah, a little bit of a Recharge. Um, they're basically a global leader in online prepaid payments. The main idea is to make prepaid uh, easy. Uh, we offer around like 16,000 like digital vouchers and prepaid solutions, stuff like gift cards, prepaid money cards, you know, like a pay safe cards, uh, trans cash, PCS, etc. Also like call credits. Uh, we operate like literally across the world. We are present in 180 different markets right now. And uh, yeah, we are actually headquartered in Amsterdam. And yeah, we recently acquired a company called Star Select which is actually one of Neil's old customers as well. So is Recharge, actually. It's also one of uh, Neil's old customers. And yeah, that's that's a little bit about Recharge. Guys, thank you so much for joining in this amazing, I think it was very insightful. But as Neil said, we are fraud nerds. So <laughs> I really hope everybody found it as entertaining and as insightful as we did for ourselves. Um, and as for the people watching this video, we invite you to reach out with any questions to Payment G's, Fugu, and Recharge.